So good morning, everyone who just joined. Uh, my name is Fergal Kenny. I'm uh, the original founder of Digital Irish. If you're not familiar with us, we're a group that promotes Irish innovation around the world. Um, we're founded in New York, but we've now got chapters in, in London as well. Um, and uh, yeah, we promote Irish innovation through um, through a couple of things. Number one, events. We've uh, uh, historically done uh, a lot of in-person events. Obviously, we've moved to virtual now. Um, but uh, events, uh, we've now got a podcast, uh, the Digital Irish Podcast, which you can find on Spotify. And um, and now we're, we've we've moved to virtual. So our events typically, you know, highlight uh, Irish innovation, Irish startups, and uh, and Irish innovators. And uh, we've also had a history of sort of like doing sort of learning oriented events as well, where we teach you a few things about what's going on in the world. And uh, and we decided to sort of kick this off virtually. Last week we did one on on recruiting, and uh, and we asked people who are out there who, who are interested in sort of volunteering and. Uh, and today we're going to learn a little bit about robotic process automation. So uh, Cahal's going to talk about that, but just if I can just uh, talk about it in, uh, a little bit before he does. Um, it, we call this a sort of like a superpower. This is an opportunity to, uh, you know, to raise your game, right? Um, it's one of those things where you sort of, it's better to learn about it and, and be a disruptor with it rather than be disrupted by it. Um, it's seriously powerful. Um, and uh, and in case you think it's sort of like very abstract, there's lots of uh, lots of ways that regular people can use it. So, I mean, I've got a small recruiting firm. Um, I'm using Airtable for a CRM, which is you know a little bit of low code. Uh, there's some RPA components that you can uh, that that you can factor into it. Uh, I've also started playing around with this uh, with another company called Airslate as well. Um, so, just in case you think this is uh, this is beyond your reach. There's lots of ways in which you can free up your time to either be much more efficient or spend your day on the golf course, whatever works for you, right? Um, but uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to hand over to Colin McCabe. Colin's, Colin's with uh, Soft Automotive and uh, he's based in the UK and he's going to tell you a little bit about uh, about RPA and then we're going to see a little demo afterwards and then we'll open it up to, uh, to questions and answers afterwards. And uh, if you wouldn't mind, I mean, I think we're going to force you all to go on mute, but... Uh, but in, in the event that you escape from mute, uh, go back and mute yourself if you don't mind. Okay. Cahal, over to you. Thank you, Fergal. Can everybody hear me okay to begin with? Yep. Am I on there? Great. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, we're, we're all okay, on so mute. Let, <laughs> let, <laughs> let me just share a screen first. Let's we'll start from there. Okay, cool. So, um, Welcome everybody and thanks for tuning in today and uh, especially thanks to Digital Irish and, and Fergal and Gavin in particular uh, for pulling this together. It's obviously um, difficult to meet up these days but this is the next best thing and it's uh, exciting to present on robotic process automation or RPA today. And <clears throat> really in this presentation what we want to do is just to give people a flavor of what um, this concept of RPA is all about. And just as Fergal touched on, it sounds like a complex or abstract um, topic, but in reality, it's, it's quite simple. And it's something that um, is coming to affect our everyday lives and our work lives more and more. So the first um, <clears throat> task that we have here in this presentation really is, is for everybody to come away with an understanding of what robotic process automation is all about in simple terms. And secondly, uh, and most importantly, how it's relevant, um, how it's relevant to you and how it's relevant to you and your work you do, but also um, in the bigger scheme of things as well and how it may be relevant to your company and industry. And in that as well, we will also look at um, the market placing of it and how much this is exploding as an industry and is set to continue for more growth for the years ahead. So just uh, to begin with, um, yes, yeah, so just briefly, uh, just a quick introduction on myself. I, um, my background is, is in manufacturing um, before moving across to RPA. So I worked in sales and operations, um, starting out in the meat industry, uh, where I worked out in, in Europe and France, Belgium and Holland in export. 
and then coming back to Dublin to work for Guinness or Diageo in sales um, before finishing up further study and moving out to America um, where I came across this industry of robotic process automation. And since then, I've moved across to uh, the London team to work uh, in EMEA. And like us all, I'm working remotely and back home, working from home and getting used to the new way of working. So <clears throat> in terms of an agenda, um, firstly, what we want to do is, is give an overview of RPA, Robotic Process Automation, what it's all about, um, what it means in terms of a definition that we can all come away with and understanding, but also where the um, industry originated, how it started and how it's becoming more and more relevant in today's working world. <coughs> Secondly, then we'll move into the growing RPA market and um, we'll have a look at some forecasts in terms of how uh, industry-wide this is growing at a really rapid pace and that's really from the beginning of the early 2000s is when this really um, started out and it's been a very very fast growth since and it's projected to grow at a, at a higher rate and really the important part of that is where it's relevant to us in our everyday working lives and, and that's right down to a one-person business and a one-person startup who um, as Fergal alluded to in his work um, he's used for, for, for RPA um, in terms of uh, scraping and web scraping and, and work like that that a recruiter can do on their own right up to a, a large fortune 1000 company um, that has more complex processes and full automation strategies that they can work on <clears throat> and from there we go into a demo and um, that's when uh, Owen Ireland owns on the call so Owen will take over the screen and just give us a very very brief overview of how this software works in simple terms. And the purpose of the demo really is to help us visualize the software itself in action, which will give us a clearer picture as to how it all works and how it can be relevant to us. And finally, we'll move on to getting started and where RPA can be a help to you in terms of getting up and running. For, uh, for completely for newcomers, but also for people that may be on the call, that may have an understanding of RPA already, or may already be engaged with RPA. Um, and, and we look at some tips in this part as to how people can scale up and build a strategy for the future with RPA as well. And finally, um, we leave some time at the end for a Q&A session for questions and answers and would really encourage people to share any thoughts or questions that they have as we go through the slides in the chat bar and we leave some time at the end then to um, address all that and furthermore I leave my contact information as well and um, so if there's any further follow-ups or anything that needs further clarification information I'd be more than happy to follow up also. Okay, so let's get started into it then. So firstly is an overview of RPA and robotic process automation and what it's all about. Um, <clears throat> so there's a common theme I guess we'll see throughout the presentation is that the industry in general is still working towards industry standards. And the first point um, on this and the most obvious point is that there's no, still no clear um, one size fits all definition of RPA just yet. People are still um, have their own definitions. If you, you even go to um, leading RPA companies and talk to employees in companies, everybody will have their own slant and their own take on, on what RPA is in terms of definition. But there are some definites and um, these are uh, briefly mentioned here. So first and foremost, um, for people to grasp, but this is software, it's not hardware. It's software, it's like a digital system that sits on your computer. And the definition that I use myself for RPA, which I find being really helpful, is a software that helps automate any work process that doesn't require human judgment. So if it requires human judgment, it's not necessarily a suitable candidate for RPA. 
But if it doesn't require human judgment and is rules-based, repetitive, or manual, that then is a good candidate for RPA typically. So just in terms of a couple of, uh, of, of additional points as well that you may notice here, um, this concept of attended or unattended automation. So attended automation is um, a fast growth area in the industry and that's where the robot has interaction with you, the employee, at the end of the day. Whereas the, the industry typically started out in the unattended space, which was a robot working 24 seven in the background that had no interaction with the employee. But we're seeing more and more of a growth and more and more of a, of a, a switch and a tendency towards attended automation, which is bringing extra value in terms of how um, front end workers are working. So the likes of salespeople, the likes of um, um, client success teams that are looking for customer responses, they're looking for consumer behavior. And uh, we find in more and more use cases moving towards this attended piece as well. And just to give a kind of a context and a, a, a brief um, a brief history and origin of the industry itself as well, um, the, the, the starting point really, if we go back to late 1950s, when um, particularly in America, there was a, a lot of movement around people looking at how organizations were behaving and behavior of processes and employees within organizations. And there was a famous work um, by Donald Hebb at the time, which, which has gone on to become a well-known book around the organization of behavior. And from that emerged a lot of thinking and a lot of uh, thought movements around how machines operated in companies and what interaction machinery had with employees. And from that, we had um, growing movements such as machine learning and the concept of training your computers to think like humans and the progress around um, your computer now beating you at chess or beating you at checkers, um, that the, the, the computer was able to mimic and mime human actions. And really, this, all these movements were, were, were growing side by side, but typically the, the, the first origins of the concept of robotic process automation goes back to the early 2000s. And there was a, a leading paper at the time um, by HFS on robotic automation emerging as a threat to traditional outsourcing. So a lot of companies were looking at outsourcing at the time and struggling with processes. They were having administrative burdens, too much in their hands and too much in their plate that they couldn't get around to, and they were outsourcing that. But in the background, this technology and this machinery was emerging that was able to free up the time and free up the bandwidth for employees to work on that. So in summary, for to take away um, a clear understanding of what RPA is, it's software and it's automation technology which mimics human actions. So again, to simplify it and really to get it on the back of a cigarette box and nice and simple that we all understand, it's software that automates um, human actions that are rules-based, repetitive, and manual. So that brings us into what we can do with RPA. And again, just to give a quick flavor, um, and really the important part here is these are just a few examples. Um, but these are top line, some very, very simple examples that everyday business and everyday employees face um, in their day-to-day -day work. These typically are um, processes that can be outsourced to RPA. So if we think about it, businesses essentially are made up of several processes and departments that sit in those businesses are made up of several processes. So really it's the constant struggle that businesses have to sharpen up these processes and to make the whole um, process machine more efficient. And this is where RPA can help businesses do that in terms of uh, reaching further, reaching deeper with the data that they're working with and working more efficiently around that data. So this slide um, of being RPA being the gateway to greater digitization, uh, there's a couple of things to maybe um, deduct from this. And, and the first is that um, RPA really is a 
really good starting point for companies that are on their transformation agenda. So it's a good opening gambit and a precursor to intelligent automation. So starting with RPA, um, understanding how it works and really working towards automating manual processes um, to make companies work more efficiently. RPA tends to be a good starting point. And Forbes had a study on this where they found that RPA was the nucleus of 69% roughly of digital strategies. So they did a, a, a study right across multiple companies to look at um, intelligent automation and digital strategy and they found that RPA was at 69%, really at the nucleus of the heart, at the heart of what companies were doing when it came to digitization. Um, these studies um, that I might reference throughout, I've left a reference list at the end of the presentation and more than happy to share the presentation with anybody that wants it and wants to do further reading on it. Um, so I might just dip into these from time to time and hopefully it'll be help to take on. The second point in this is that um, RPA essentially is the glue between old legacy systems that companies have because it's so easy to implement and it shows a return on investment quite quickly. And the other part that, that, that's important with RPA as well as being easy to implement, it doesn't really require or necessarily require re-architecturing of systems either. So RPA can be a great place to start. And for companies that are um, very early on and really looking at um, upping their game digitally, RPA is a good starting point. So just to debunk a couple of myths around RPA as well, what it's not, as well as what it is, um, it's not physical robots. So um, it's not going to be, um, it's software that sits in your computer. It's not going to be robots running around the office anytime too soon. It sits on your computer. Um, so it's software, not hardware. I think importantly as well to note, and a lot of people would have reaction around RPA as an industry possibly replacing humans and replacing employees. But really that comes down to the industry and it comes down to the specific context and, and, and regionally and the case by case basis. But generally at this time, what I can say is that a lot of studies have been carried out um, on the effects of RPA in the workplace. And one particular study, which again will be um, at the end of the presentation and reference, would be the Forrester study from March 2019, which conducted um, across multiple industries, government, financial services, manufacturing, insurance, thousands of companies. And it looked at how RPA was um, affecting the employee experience. And from that study, found a there was a 72% increase in employee engagement with companies that had RPA programs in place. And that was correlating to job retention and people staying longer in their jobs. And finally, on cost saving. Cost saving is a huge part of, our, of, of RPA. And <clears throat> one of the first things that it, it, uh, it, it, it works on and shows is an immediate ROI and return on investment. But there's a lot more um, that it can offer on top of cost saving, such as uh, quality of work, as an example, eliminating human error. And in that, um, that leading on to increased uh, customer satisfaction as well. And we obviously talked about um, employee satisfaction internally also, but also it's, it's, uh, it's, it's like effectively um, the start of a digital workforce where you can have a team working for you 24 seven um, and there's no such um, blockers in, in terms of time limits or time bounds on, on the work that can be done. Carl, a quick question if you don't mind. Uh, yeah. Is, is, it, is it primarily focused on, you know, replacing a human's interactions with the screen or would it also cover like, uh, you know, kind of pre-processing pre -processing PDF documents automat automatically, that kind of stuff. I'm just wondering about the scope. Sure, sure, absolutely. It's important to, to come away with, it, with an understanding, Peter. Um, what RPA does is, is, is it, it focuses on these processes that don't require human judgment. 
So if we think of processes that don't require human judgment, and we just go back up to this slide here. So you have a lot of processes in a, in a company where you're moving data from system to system, or you may be scraping information off uh, a website, as an example, or filling in forms or filling in fields. This kind of work that doesn't require human judgment, that's the kind of work that's a sweet spot for RPA. And on top of that then, if you combine the, the human worker with what the human can bring, which, which RPA can't bring, and that's around human intelligence and making judgments, that's, that's where the, the, the employee sits alongside RPA and they work, work hand in hand. Right. I mean, I think maybe the fifth bullet answers my question a little bit. So it's not just, it's not just automatically interacting with the screen. It's automatically interacting with, say, an image or a PDF, right? Yeah, it is. It is, and 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 to delve a little further, Peter, on that, um, most RPA software will have further integrations as well, and one such integration is it's what what we call optical character uh, recognition (OCR) technology, and the OCR technology can read images and read text, which is unstructured data because it's inconsistent from form to form, but with that. Uh, unstructured data, it'll convert it to structured data, which a machine or a robot, uh, such as an RPA bot, will understand and will work with it from there. Okay, cool, thanks. Okay. So, um, so just, yeah, on, 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 on what RPA is not, I think, and, 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 and it's a good um, addition to this as well, um, and there's a good debate on this, and there's, a, there's an RPA update podcast, uh, which is available on Spotify, and most, uh, most carriers will have it. But on the first episode, they have a good lively discussion on whether RPA is intelligent or not. And again, because there's no industry standards, uh, people can take a side on it, whether they believe it is intelligent or isn't intelligent. I'd probably be in the camp myself of it not being intelligent. It's very much um, machinery and technology that needs to be told very, very specifically what to do on a line by line basis. And if that process is broken or if it isn't in that order, um, the machine won't be able to carry it out. It won't have the intelligence to read in between the lines effectively. And just to segue as well to, to, to add in this, because it's if, if you have a general conversation with somebody on the street about what robotic process automation is, um, and people are you know becoming to understand it more and more, and we look at its market size in a moment and where where the, the hype is coming from, but it's important to understand as well that there are differences between um, RPA and AI. They're not the same thing. And I thought this slide might be a good way and a simple way to explain it um, that, that, that people could understand. So artificial intelligence is the mind um, making decisions on your behalf. So a very simple example in everyday terms would be when we fill out an email and you're starting a sentence and the, the, your, 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 um, your email application might make a suggestion for you um, for how the sentence should finish out. And that's artificial intelligence um, making a decision for you. And whether you want to act on that decision is, 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 is your own decision at the end of the day, but that's the intelligence of the, of the machine uh, making that decision for you. RPA can't do that. What RPA does is, if we think of it simply, it's the handwork. It's the, the heavy lifting behind um, the moving of data from, from applications. And that's, um, in very simple terms, a nice way to think of it, where RPA is the, the, the handwork and artificial intelligence is the mind at work. So in terms of the evolution of the, the, the industry, again, just to give a very, very brief overview, we're moving into this area here of, of hyper automation and intelligent automation. And that really is customers who are now, or we'd, we'd say customers and businesses and companies looking at how, uh, at this whole larger toolbox of options and RPA being one part of that, but it being integrated with cognitive technologies. So again, we touched on OCR being a good example of that. Uh, Jack's on the call as well, and um, he works in the, in the line of big data being another good example of these are 
um, integrations that are added on with RPA and create quite a powerful um, end result. And uh, Gartner um, do a lot of work and, and research in these fields. And they talk about RPA not being alone, but it's a combination of all these pieces that replicate the human behavior in full. I think one point that's maybe relevant to people to add in here as well on, on this slide is Hello. Am I back? Yeah, Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, I was saying about uh, on, on RPA being more accessible to people. Uh, I think it's important to add that in as well. Um, let me just go back to this bit before we go to the market. So with RPA, when it started out, um, naturally it was quite a heavy lift for companies. and. Uh, the industry really focused probably on heavy processes and, and big complex pieces of work. But really now to most people, um, RPA has become a lot more accessible in terms of pricing. And there's a lot more flexibility in terms of how that works as well. Um, we've had more entrants into the market. So even larger companies like Microsoft have come into the market recently as well. And they have changed up um, how pricing works with a with a pricing per 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 user per month, but also pricing per process. But what you have as well, I think, is um, RPA becoming a lot more accessible um, to small startup companies um, to focus on small tasks right up to your Fortune 1000s. I think really the industry now is, is something for, for everybody to look at. And that's probably a very exciting development as well. So just to give a quick flavor on the, on the market and um, just so people can have a, an idea of the context and the size of, of how big it's got. Um, and this gives the total spend um, on, on white collar automations between RPA, intelligent automation and artificial intelligence. And, and again, this is probably the second point in terms of the team of, of not having industry uh, clear or working towards clear industry standards. The, when we look at this, uh, which was which uh, HFS researches uh, forecasts, again, they'll vary um, to what Gartner and Forrester and other analysts are saying. But just to give an idea of the size of it, we're looking at RPA here at a 0 0.8 billion uh, market in 2017. By 2023, it's going to be 10 times that, at 10.4 billion. And RPA sits quite handsomely uh, within the total um, automation and artificial intelligence piece as well. And again, if we just look at Forrester, they have a different approach on it um, and a different number. And uh, they're reporting 16 times uh, a growth from 2017. I might just move this across. 16 times um, at 1.2 billion in 2017, right up to, uh, to, to 16.4 billion in 2023. So again, um, like its definition, there's probably not a very, very clear uh, forecast on it. But I think the one thing that we can definitely take away from this is that the growth in it is absolutely huge and that um, being more accessible to more and more companies is a big part of why it's in such a fast growth mode as well. Important to just give a quick uh, overview regionally as well. And naturally, you can expect that the Western world are um, more ahead and more advanced with RPA than your emerging markets. But your LATAMs, Asia and EMEA are in faster growth as well than they were. And this is, tw this is from last year, and I think um, by 2023, we'll see that the, the, the pie may become a little bit more segmented again. So in terms of the adoption of RPA, um, it's, I, I think this gives uh, a good flavor to, to everybody on the call in terms of the significance of it. Um, so by 2023, Gartner reporting that 85% of enterprises will have some sort of RPA deployment. 
which is a, a huge, huge rise from where we were um, going back a couple of years ago. And in terms of just a, a quick flavor of a business breakdown internally, this is multifunctional as well. Starting out with finance and accounting, which were um, the main uh, adopters of it and the traditional adopters of it. And if you look at different industries, typically your banking and finance and insurance um, have been first um, to, adopt or, to adopt RPA and first have a, a full strategy on board. But it's, 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 it's growing out across uh, all verticals now at this stage as well. I think um, one more piece to add in on the, on the shortage of, of industry standards and something we had a conversation about earlier um, about opening up the industry. And, and it's one thing that we're working on a lot at the moment as well. And in terms of creating commonalities for people and we've created the first um, RPA language, uh, which is a fully open source language called Robin. And the, the advantage of that is that it removes vendor lock-in for people uh, for down the road. And that's how we envisage it, rather than um, companies having one commitment to, to, to one vendor only, hopefully um, companies will have the flexibility in choosing multiple vendors and working across the board a bit more. So just to give a quick flavor on the changing uh, of the market, and, and I'll pass over to Owen then so he can give us a quick look at a demo. But I think this is important, um, given that I've tried to avoid using the word COVID or uh, coronavirus here just to uh, move away from it. But naturally, it's had a huge impact on the industry and, and, and all, in all industries. But I think what this shows is that a couple of things. I think it shows that 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 RPA um, after cybersecurity is um, likely to, to remain in growth, and that really is probably coming from a couple of things. That it's good for the 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 the, the, the industry will be advancing um, with this pivot and with this change in environment. But also, I think RPA has a, has a huge offering. And we can look at a couple of use cases um, around um, its response to COVID as well, which have been really helpful too. But in terms of an outlook, I think what we can probably look at from here is that companies, rather than breaking down in silos, I think the response we've seen so far, and we're only six weeks in, but the response we've seen so far is that businesses are now taking stock of their inventory and, and they're looking at digital strategies now that they have a bit more time to look at these things and a bit more bandwidth to look internally. Um, I think to see a value and need in um, the likes of RPA as a software to take on board. Um, we're seeing in terms of the industry itself, there's been a bit of a pivot. So traditional vendors and traditional uh, RPA ways of working of uh, complex processes and on-site work is now moving away to become more accessible. So we're now looking at uh, cloud strategies and everyday um, RPA work in terms of how we can work remotely to help the everyday worker um, that doesn't necessarily need to be on-site or doesn't necessarily need to be a heavy process. It can be a simple front-end sales process and how can RPA become more accessible to people like that. And I think in terms of the industry response as well, there's been a lot of, and you, you'll, you'll, you'll notice a lot if you um, check it out online in terms of some of the work that's been done with various vendors in terms of response. And even in Ireland, we've had a couple of um, major cases. So um, a Matter Hospital in Dublin um, being a good example, in the Matter Hospital, they've taken on attended automation bots that nurses have interaction with. And what that is uh, doing is it's processing the, 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 the control around the testing kits, the COVID-19 testing kits a lot quicker. And, and with that work, it's reducing stress on the, on the nurses for sure, but it's also saving three hours per day per worker on paperwork uh, when it comes to processing these results. And it's one potential positive um, impact of COVID is that a sector like the healthcare sector, which is really under huge stress and pressure at the moment, it's a chance that 
um, the, the, the industry itself will become more in tune with, with technologies and, and with ways of working that'll make things more efficient, please God, in the longer term as well. Um, likewise, Social Welfare Office in Ireland for, um, for payments, for um, unemployed payments and the huge pressure they've come under, they're also using um, automation RPA uh, software as well to help them with the processing of uh, searching on um, employees and companies that they cross-checking companies that they have, have lost work with uh, and processing the speed of payment across the accounts as well. So that gives a quick flavour. Um, with that, we have a few minutes to, 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 for our own maybe to take on and have a quick look at a demo and we can maybe go back to business benefits and questions and answers from there. If that works, Owen. Yeah, great. Thanks, Carl. Hi, everyone. Great to be here. Um, so I'm one of the pre-sales managers here in the UK. And what I wanted to do today was really just give you guys a, a flavor of the solution. Naturally, if there's any further inquiries, if there's any further interest, um, you know, by all means, uh, initiate that, that conversation with with Carl, but we thought it would be a, a nice um, opportunity for you guys to, to see what an RPA tool looks like if you've not um, you know, been familiar with it uh, previously. So in this instance, I'm running Win Automation. This is the console that we can see. Um, you can see on the left hand side, a list of folders, and this is where I keep all of the different automations that I've uh, built over the years. Um, mainly for me, they help me in my day-to-day -day work. And it brings me on to a point that Carl did mention around the scalability and the utility of these automations. We have clients ranging from single, um, single users who, like me, are using the tool to help them with um, maybe even small tasks on a day-to-day -day basis. And then other, uh, you know, large clients, maybe um, JP Morgan or IBM, um, you know, obviously large corporates who are doing some very large end-to-end -end processes with the tool as well. Um, I think it's, it's good to know uh, the degree of scalability and flexibility of, of this tool. Um, but I think uh, for today's purposes, we'll concentrate on just what it looks like uh, to have a small task running, uh, helping you in your day-to-day -day life. And then perhaps you can extrapolate from that as to what this, uh, you know, what the potential of this tool is. So on the left-hand side, I've got all of my different uh, folders, um, and in demos, I've got my digital Irish uh, folder, and I've got um, a process here, which is Excel data to web page. So I think you immediately from reading that probably know what this is going to do. So the context of this for me is someone emails me um, a fairly standard um, uh, Excel spreadsheet on a daily basis that it's a list of um, products, product codes, descriptions, unit costs, and things like that. And I, um, as a you know, um, finance person, it's up to me to put this data into, um, you know, into a repository or a database or a web page somewhere. That's obviously going to take um, a lot of time. So I've automated this. How did I automate it? Well, we'll go into that in a little bit, but with this tool, you only need to show uh, the tool uh, how to do it once, and then that's it saved, and um, it will work like that for you forever. Um, so here, I could actually start the process manually, but what's even more powerful is automating the automation. So if we just have a look at the top here, on the top ribbon, I've got my triggers and schedules. This is really the backbone of um, RPA, if you will, because of course, you don't want to be sat manually um, initiating all of these processes. It's much more efficient to allow certain conditions, conditions or provisos to be met for this um, automation to help you with your day. So if I look at triggers, for example, I can select new triggers. 
this might be um, a file monitor trigger. So if I'm doing something in a shared folder or with a certain file or a certain document, I can get the bot to recognize that and then do a subsequent action. Something extremely popular is email monitors. So of course you can set up very elaborate rules and conditions within things like Outlook um, and other email uh, providers. Uh, but with this, you can do uh, so much more. So for example, one very popular use of this, this tool with some of the smaller enterprises is um, receiving emails with um, PDF purchase orders, for example. You set this trigger up to recognize that there is an invoice attached or, or some paperwork such as a purchase order and it will do something with that uh, with that document so that's a very powerful one and things like hotkey triggers we all use hotkeys sometimes uh, maybe to even just lock our workstation you know windows but an l is a nice quick way of doing that minimize we tend to use hotkeys and so you can um, set up very specific bespoke hotkeys to fire off at your process. The same with schedules. So it might be that you have to run a report midnight uh, every single uh, weekday. So you can set this up by um, um, configuring it uh, here with the specific times. So those are the two key backbones of automation is around conditions or certain um, timeframes to to occur for the automation to trigger. In this instance, we'll just uh, press uh, play as I call it. And it's taking me to this uh, web page and it's going to retrieve the Excel uh, document from my email. And as we can see, it's going through the product codes um, and I've mapped all of the relevant fields within the Excel page uh, into my um, product database, my finance database. And you can see it's just cycling through those. It's clearly taking a much shorter amount of time than I would as a manual uh, user. Um, but it's important to note as well for demo purposes, I've slowed this uh, down. Um, you can see the yellow, uh, the, the fields are colored in yellow to show we're in uh, debug mode, if you will. Um, this would actually run substantially quicker if um, if we're out of debug mode. And it's already, you know, saving me a lot of time. So you can imagine if this wasn't even um, in front of me, if this was um, just uh, running by itself in the background, it frees me up to do uh, a lot of other stuff. And I could specify to do that. So now I've built the main part of my automation, which is please put all of this um, information into the, the repository or the database there, um, I could actually have that um, completely running um, invisible as well. So I can specify and tweak at all points. And what you'd find is if, if you ever um, use an RPA tool, um, once you learn about the tool, you'll find that you can uh, tweak and improve at all points. What I've also built as well is an error checker. Uh, to say, send me a message to say, if you think there's some sort of discrepancy in, please, um, please tell me. And so luckily the bot has spotted something um, that's, that's out, of the, uh, out of the range of acceptable figures and it's told me something. So I can now go into that and investigate uh, further. So that's all very uh, basic. I hope um, that's, that's clear for you. Naturally, like I mentioned, there's, varying degrees of complexity of automations. Um, but let's look at what it's like to actually build uh, something very simple. So what do I do? I just click on a uh, new uh, process on the top left hand side here. And it's asked me to uh, name the process. And I've got three options. The first is the process designer. This is the ground up step by step um, designing of my process, action by action. The other two are about the bot recording what I'm doing and it will create the actions for me. So it's, um, it's kind of meta automation, if you will. Um, it automates the automation process. But for today, let's just go into the ground up the hard way, if you will.
and I'm presented with the process designer that you can see. Like before, I've got folders on the left-hand side. And as you might be able to see with a quick scan, they're all, they're all each a family of automations uh, that I might want to use. For example, web automation. It's something that I might want to um, launch a new Chrome or indeed extract some values from a web page. And we'll look at that in a second. Uh, we all use Excel, Excel still to this day, so we've got a substantial amount of Excel actions. Carl did mention around uh, cognitive. Now, we are the RPA specialists. We're the specialists in this tool, and we like to leave the machine learning side of things to the guys who are um, you know, in that space, but we don't close the doors to it at all. So if, um, if you do have any Google, IBM or Microsoft cognitive functionality, then you can plug into it straight away with uh, these actions here. So really, really useful. Furthermore, I did mention things like purchase orders, invoices, that type of thing. They're typically handwritten or PDFs. So we give you the functionality to be able to use something like CaptureFast or OCR to be able to read the images. So there's an element of AI or machine learning there, if you will. Um, still extremely uh, useful and very, very capable, even with just these small amount of actions here. And there is a um, there is a downloadable uh, copy. I think uh, Carl probably will mention that uh, another time later in the session. Yeah. Um, we, but if ever you wanted to uh, use this um, and have a have a play with it, then then by all means do. And you can go and have a look at uh, the weird and wonderful and comprehensive world of these out of the box actions. Um, but suffice it to say, there's uh, there's almost 400 out of the box actions uh, here. So let's make use of some. I'm a busy person, so I just want to uh, get some currency rates um, sent to me because I've got some Forex exposure uh, with some uh, properties abroad. Um, obviously, there's apps that do this, this type of thing, but this is a nice demonstration of uh, the functionality. You can see I want to launch a new Chrome. Let's just test it out to see if this works. Fine. Okay. So what I'm doing here, in a way I'm developing, in a way I'm programming, but I don't need to know um, any um, uh, you know, strange languages or anything like that. This is literally English. So all I really needed to do is think about what I want to automate and articulate this in English with these actions. So then what I want to do is automate the automation like I mentioned before, and I'll use the web spy here. So I go here. Um, Win Automation is very uh, sort of preemptively intelligent, so it even pre-populates this. It understands that I'm going to want to use this uh, this uh, Chrome instance and go to the right web page as well. Then on the right hand side, hopefully you can see. I'll just move it. Um, hopefully you can see it's the recorded actions. So it's going to just watch what I'm doing and then articulate those in action. So I want. Um, to look for currencies. Bloomberg is a good um, place for that. And you can see um, it also understands the structure of the underlying web page as well and tells me that. So it, it's really nice, really easy to navigate and you feel very assured of what you're doing and what you're um, interacting with. Um, what I think I'll do is right click and then extract the parent HTML table, something like that. And you can see it's written all of these actions for me, easy peasy. So I don't even need to do it sort of drag and drop, which is easy enough by itself. I can even just, um, you know, use the, the web spy uh, to, to just create a bit automation within, you know, 30, 30 seconds, which over a week will save me a substantially more amount of time. Okay, so let's uh, let's just give that a run and see see how it fares. Okay, it's running through. Takes me to currencies. So what I might do, given that it's spotted an error, what I think I'll do is make life easier and quicker, 
and instead of going all the way around the houses is just put this in instead and now I've made my automation simply into uh, two uh, actions simple taking me straight there and perfect and it's saved all those now like I mentioned before I've built the core, the spine of my automation very, very quickly. I can go back to this continuously. I can add headers if I want. I can perhaps use, um, for example, we've got some email actions here. I might want to send this um, to my email somewhere. I could send this to a group of emails. I could do absolutely anything uh, with it. But hopefully that just shows you how quickly you can automate something and how um, kind of preemptively intelligent um, the, the tool is to be able to uh, speed up your uh, developing of automations. Cahal, um, unless there's any questions, that's all I really wanted to show, just to give a tiny flavour of Perfect. the tool. Thank you, Owen. Thank you. Yeah, if you can relinquish the share the screen, and I'll take over. Um, and we, we'll move into a question and answer session, but just um, briefly, just to wrap up on a couple of things here that might give people a little bit more context. Um, and that being around, let me just close this out. That being around, I, again, Owen just showed how easy it is to use. So really in terms of ideas, the first starting point with it is to um, have a look internally at your own processes um, between multiple departments. It, it really works across uh, your finance and accounting right through to your HR. So it's a, it's a good time to have a think about what processes internally are holding you up and, and, and are uh, getting in the way of progress. And these typically, if they are processes that don't necessarily require human judgment, these are good processes and a good place to start with um, and a good candidate for process automation. So I'm obviously conscious of time um, given that we have a few minutes left. So maybe it might be best to open it up to questions and answers and we can maybe address some other issues and other um, facts and bits and pieces as well um, throughout the call as well, if that's a help. Okay, if you have a question, uh, feel free to use the chat box. And if, uh, we can do them one by one. Perfect. Carl, maybe just in the meantime, can you sort of explain sort of like how this ties in or doesn't tie in with low code and no code solutions. Sure, sure. So as Owen, as you saw in the demo with Owen, it's our tool is, is a drag and drop tool and a lot of RPA, um, the, the industry is still split. Um, some tools are code. Um, so therefore to build processes, it, it requires coding, but some um, tools are geared more towards the business user and non IT people so they can easily build through drag and drop um, processes on a day-to-day -day basis. And that leads into the bigger piece as well, um, where RPA sits in amongst intelligent automation. So as we saw earlier, um, with extra cognitive capabilities, there's more and more use cases that can be built in um, and, and deeper use cases with further integrations also. And just to um, add on, I had a slide here that I just wanted to run through. In terms of this piece here, <clears throat> there's two schools of thinking really around RPA so far. And the first is, is starting um, to find out what are the complex processes and try and tidy up these processes and, and outsource it to RPA. First is the other approach and, and would be more so our own school of thinking of starting small uh, and minimizing the risk with it. So really choosing um, a day-to-day -day burden um, that, that your company's having or you're having in your day-to-day -day job and, and really mastering that piece on a smaller basis with, with less risk involved and less of a heavy lift and realizing the value and, and the ROI on that before scaling up and moving on then to, to later and bigger pieces. Carl, Carl, what I would say is um, the solution, as as you saw with Owen, 
Um, it, it's certainly, uh, it's drag and drop. It, it's designed for non-developers. However, um, what you'll see within there, there are some specific actions um, for things like um, for Python, for VB script, for, for command line stuff. So if you do have um, developers that are writing scripts that are doing that kind of work, they can actually build those into the automation as well by calling those scripts um, from within um, from within, from within one of the tools. So it, so it kind of covers both bases, but it's very much designed um, to be a to be a um, to be a no code environment. Yeah. It's yeah, for, for the business user, for for the everyday user, in, in terms of what is the value um, that RPA can play in their role, whether it's a, a one person startup that's having difficulty with bandwidth to to cover different areas, right up to a more developed and fully functioning Fortune 5000 company. But in terms of the the getting underway and and, and really furthering our understanding with it. There was a talk during the week um, with the uh, the head of automation for GM Financial in the US, and he did a presentation on going from zero to 60 with RPA. And he looked at it from two aspects. He looked at it from um, a complete newcomer to RPA that hadn't adopted RPA or heard of RPA before and where they can get started and where it can add a lot of value uh, and, and return on investment to your own business. But secondly, he looked at a company that had an RPA strategy, but it plateaued and was struggling to scale it up and move it on to the next level. So I've referenced that here as well um, in, in, in the PowerPoint, which is available to anybody. If anybody wants to reach out, you're more than welcome and I can share all these resources. And I've shared a couple of extra things as well, such as a, a free trial where people can um, see the software in action and get underway with it and, and, and start to build um, and automate their own work straight away. And some extra learning resources as well around um, YouTube videos and our own academy in terms of how the software works and how um, the everyday user can use it. Oh, you can see some of the questions there in the uh, in the chat box. Okay. Uh, if you can't see them, I'll read them to you. Um, yeah, if you could read them out, Fergal. Oh, I see chat here now. Yeah, yeah. We're used to Google Hangouts. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so Gavin has asked, who's so typically the decision maker and the buyer in an organization for this? It's really, uh, it's an agnostic software, Gavin. It's, it's, it's really works across every industry, but likewise, it works across every department as well. We, we looked at the, the slide earlier where um, it, it showed the use mainly in finance and accounting. So typically, um, we don't have an answer to, to start with. Um, there's use in it for everybody, and that's one of the difficulties that we have is in trying to really zone in on, on, on what the needs of a given department and given person is. Typically, a CFO and um, a COO, in terms of how they want to improve their processes, make their own internal processes more efficient, and how they want to build productivity within it, in the company, um, are typically go-to people for smaller or medium enterprises. For larger enterprises than your Fortune 5000s and on, um, Typically, they'll have um, you know head of heads of automation like Sam Best uh, during the week, and um, people that have a full strategy underway around RPA specifically. So it really depends on company to company. And um, Peter, so what's the landscape of products to consider in the RPA space? I presume each product is a toolbox of automation tools, mostly fairly similar. Yeah, um, I think. If you were to look across the, 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 the various RPA vendors and various platforms, re in reality, there's not huge differences um, across the board. Some are, are, are no code like yourselves, some use code. Um, but likewise, um, most will have an ecosystem of, of, of partners as well. And that's where your, your intelligent automation piece and your wider toolbox comes in. Typically, most vendors are quite similar on it. Yeah, so they've specialized typically in, in 
in your um, OCR piece, which is a very, very regular use case for people when it comes to application forms and filling out forms, is recognizing um, the case we went through, recognizing that unstructured data and trying to convert it into something that RPA can understand. And that's the use case that um, has been built with the welfare office in Dublin as well when it comes to the unemployment benefit payments. It's about reading those forms and converting it into something then that the robot can act on, do the background check and process the payment on quite quickly and straight away. Oh, the other, I mean, I suppose the other piece all sets as, as uh, Peter indicates, very similar. You'll find somebody like Blue Prism are, are almost entirely focused on unattended automation. That's what they believe RPA is. Most of the other vendors will have attended and unattended. Um, I, I, think, I think where you tend to see the difference is, is the approach to implementing RPA as Carl indicated. We tend to think about things as a kind of bottom-up approach. Get the tool deployed, start automating your processes, see some ROI, then look at perfecting the process, making them as efficient and as elegant as you can. Some of the other companies take a very top-down approach where you'll build a center of excellence, identify some processes, make the processes as slick, as efficient as you can, and then you bring the RPA tool to bear and run it that way. So, I mean, I, you know, there are, there are different ways of doing it. You know, we, we have a belief in one way, the other guys will have belief in other, but I think that that tends to be more of a difference than, than the functionality within the tool set itself. So. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, th I think I think people have to remember as well that this is a particularly new industry. You know, it, 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 it's really going back to the early 2000s and it's very much changing at the moment with the current landscape as well. So the idea of the complex automations on site, people spending time on site, that's, that's moving away now to automations in the cloud and automations that are accessible for smaller businesses as well. And Gartner had a, had a recent report and looking at the future of RPA and, and a big part of it was moving to attended automation. And with attended automation, you know, front end automations that, that, that sales people and marketing people can use to get more real time data, which doesn't really exist as strongly at the moment as well. So there's a lot of changes in the industry and it still is quite early and quite new. A uh, question from John Matthews, how does this differ from workflow automation or is it a rebranding of workflow automation? Yeah, I have a slide on that that, that gives us a little understanding, um, John. So workflow automation, um, I guess RPA is a, is a, is a development. Um, it's like workflow automation version 2.0 uh, to a certain extent. So your workflow automations are typically um, like Excel macros as an example that people might understand, um, ERP scripts, screen scraping, the likes. Um, but Excel macros being a good example, RPA has a, has, has a, has a much wider kit in terms of um, what it can offer around automation. Um, so more complex rules, it has integration with other systems. Um, so we talked about um, OCR being an example. Um, it's got a, a, a much wider bandwidth. The other thing it can do as well is a breakdown between your attended and your unattended automation. So with attended automation, um, there's a lot more that can be done in terms of breaking down large complex processes, to smaller pieces which have interaction with the employee. And I think we had another question there. Can the attended person be a customer instead of an employee? Good question. Um, the attended, when we talk about attended automation, Fergal, it's, it's automation that sits on the employee's um, laptop or their desktop. So that's something that the employee will internally use. The, 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 that idea of bringing automation to the customer um, is something that it looks like is developing more and more at the moment. And it's, it's where automation and this whole industry of RPA is branching out from rather just looking at um, back-end processes 
that companies struggle with. It's about thinking about the future and, and thinking about how can we make this relevant to get real time customer insights and customer uh, feedback and, and, and analyze consumer behavior. I think there's more and more use um, of that developing at the moment. And I think it's definitely a, a space to watch. Kevin, you might have further thoughts on that piece around uh, the attended person be a customer instead of an employee. No, I thought, well, maybe, uh, maybe Owen would be better as the technical guy, but I, but I think you articulated it relatively um, well. I, I think for, for, the, for the attended piece, it tends to be on a workstation with interaction um, for a particular user. I think an automation that was was interacting with a with a customer in some way is is likely to look slightly different to that yeah yeah i i, I think the the, the the main focus really here was uh, to show a couple of things um right off and and it ties in nicely to, to the digital irish piece on um innovation around digitization last week but really, um, when we look at RPA as an industry, it's, it's really a new industry and it's still working towards industry standards. So we, we saw that with its definition to start with. We saw it with uh, forecasts in terms of how um, different analysts are forecasting very, very different numbers uh, for, for how it's growing. But we're definitely seeing the growth and the relevance and we're seeing how RPA is having to become more in touch with the everyday employee, um, be it their, uh, the, the employee that's working on their own um, remotely, or be it the employee that's working as part of a team. How, how do we break away from um, complex work and back-end work and make it really relevant to the everyday person? And I think that's the uh, general direction that the industry is going. I think we're seeing use cases now that are um that are that are good for rpa but likewise good for industries in general so it's working both ways and i think in terms of accessibility for people as well it's becoming easier to use uh, as we saw with the demo with own but also there's more and more user communities more and more resources building out from it and in terms of pricing and um, flexibility around costs. I, I don't think that's the challenge that it was for people anymore. And I think it's very, very accessible for even um, industries that, that, that have, have uh, budget difficulties for something like uh, um, advanced software. I think RPA is moving into that field of everyday software. Okay, Carl, I think, um, can you hear me? Yeah, I think yeah. Uh, that's great. I, uh, I just wanted to thank you for your time. That was uh, was really helpful. I thought the demo really brought it to life as well. Um, so uh, Owen and Kevin, thanks for your input on that in particular. That was, uh, um, thanks, it just Michael. shows it in action. And I yeah, think thank it, you very much, Michael. It makes it real for a lot of people. So we're going to, um, we're gonna, this has been recorded. We're gonna share this afterwards and uh, you, can, uh, you can do a recap if you, if you need to. Um, uh, Carl, how do people get in touch with you? Yeah, yeah, and, and thanks again uh, to all for joining. Um, in terms of uh, a, a follow ups and people wanting to find out a little bit more, I've attached some reading information at the end here, as, as I mentioned, mm -hmm. but in terms of getting underway as well, um, really encourage people to, to reach out um, more than. Uh, open to hearing from anybody in terms of ideas or getting started or wanting to find out a little bit more about the industry or how it can help them. Um, I've given my email address here, but also some extra resources for people to get started um, and just uh, a little uh, flavor of, of, of where they can develop their um, thought patterns around where automation can help them in everyday work. Okay, great. So when we... Uh... You know, when we share out the, the recording of the video, we'll share those resources as well. We'll put your email address on it as well. Um, Super. That's you on, uh, I think you can see my screen now. So that's you on LinkedIn, right? So if, yep. anyone's, uh, if anyone's looking for you, right? Um, that handsome fella, reach out to him on, uh, on LinkedIn. Um, just going back to, uh, to Digital Irish for a second. So thanks again, Carl, Owen, and, and Kevin. That was great. And it takes a lot of effort to do these things. So. Uh, appreciate the time and effort you put into doing that. 
Um, if you're looking to reach out to Digital Irish, look over my shoulder. Yeah, that, that shoulder. Um, and you can see where you can find us on Twitter, on the web, and where our podcast is. If you're not already subscribed to our podcast, please sign up to it. Um, we are doing sort of events on typically on Tuesday evenings. Uh, we've, uh, we may not do it next Tuesday, but it looks like the following Tuesday. And the next learning or masterclass oriented session that we're going to do uh, looks to be set around account-based marketing or ABM. Um, so if you're unfamiliar with that space, we're going to get you up to speed on that. But um, thanks for your time. And if you have any questions for, uh, for Digital Irish, you can ping us at, uh, at hello at digitalirish.com. Okay. So I hope you have a good weekend and stay healthy out there, everyone. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Carl. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Carl. Thanks. Bye-bye.